right. Well, it's a very small group. So thank you so much for joining us, those of you who that are here. If you haven't already done so, please put in your name, your role, and um, your SAU. Let us know where you're coming from. We like to keep track of that. And thank you for joining us for our transition plan training. We're going to talk about developing compliant transition plans. We're going to talk a little bit about the why behind that as well. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the Federal Programs Coordinator with Department of Ed, Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. I was a special education teacher for almost 30 years before I joined the department. I worked primarily with students with autism and have been with the department just over five years now. And I am so grateful that I get to work with this exceptionally talented team. So Jennifer, can you come on and say hi, please? Yeah, hi, I'm Jennifer Gleason. Um, I too was a special education teacher, functional life skills before I joined this team around two and a half years ago. Thanks, Jennifer. Carly is here. I'm Carly Thibodeau. Uh, I joined the team about a year and a half ago. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. Thanks, Carly. Ashley. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Satry. I am the newbie on the team, and I've been with the team for about six months now. And before that, I was a special ed teacher for um, 14 years here in Maine and in Virginia. Thanks, Ashley. And Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. Um, I am going into my seventh year with the Maine Department of Education. And um, prior to that, I was a uh, I was admin support at an elementary school for um, 16 years. Great. Thank you. So that is our team. This is our contact information. If you don't already have it, we really work very hard to maintain a tight turnaround in terms of if you contact us, we try to get back to you right away. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time if you have questions regarding V13 transition planning or, or anything. Let us know what you need. We're here for that. So this is our agenda. Um, we just did our introductions. And if you've just jumped in and you haven't yet done so, please put in your name, your SAU, and your role so that we can just, we just like to see who joins us. We're also going to talk about B13. When we talk about B13, that is that transition planning, that post-secondary transition planning. And we're going to talk about what that is and why it's important. We're going to go through each components of the training very specifically. We have a case study. Uh, we're going to show you a checklist that we reference that we think will be useful for you as well. We have some frequently asked questions at the end, which we won't read but we just like to include them because if others have asked, they're important. And then our resources are all at the end as well. And we'll just quickly go over those. So as you know, um, eligibility was raised to age 22 uh, via LD 98 chapter 450 that was codified in October 25th, 2023. So that is now, that is now the age of eligibility. So B13, you probably hear us talk interchangeably about, we might say transition planning, post-secondary planning, or B13 planning. So we wanted to talk about B13 just so that you know, when we say B13, what we're referencing, because I think it's important. And it is one of 17 federal indicators that we as a team are tasked to look at. We don't have to look at all of them as a team, but across the department, we look at all of them. And our team really focuses quite heavily on B13. And this is just a link that will take you to this indicator card, which will tell you exactly what all of those 17 indicators are. And it's important to talk about these indicators because those are the measures of compliance that we are scored on, if you will. It, it shows the effectiveness of our, at the state of Maine's ability to implement IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And B13 looks at the percent of youth ages 16 and above with measurable annually updated IEP goals, appropriate transition assessments, services, and courses. 
So it's really important for us as a team to closely monitor B13, that data, because we have to report it annually to OSEP, which is the Office of Special Education Programs. And what this means in a, in a nutshell um, is that if any part of your transition plan is non-compliant, we have to report the whole plan as zero. And that is really frustrating for everybody, especially you and your teams. So for example, if your transition plan has exceptionally good programming throughout, and then there's one piece that is not compliant, that whole transition plan in the eyes of OSEP is counted as 0%. And that is how we have to report it to the federal government. And so that is why we're gonna walk through each part of the transition plan very carefully, because we want you to get credit for all the work that you're doing. Compliance is one thing, right? Programming is another. They certainly are hand in hand. Our job as a team is to really monitor the compliance piece. But we never want to lose sight of programming. Because as you know, a good IEP does not necessarily mean good programming, right? And good programming doesn't necessarily equal a good IEP. We're really working to try to have you think about these two things really together because they need to really complement one another. Um, our team, as I mentioned, looks at compliance, but programming is a huge part of this as well. So we want you to just think about this quote, promote ambitious outcomes for youth. As I mentioned, I worked uh, for 30 years and I only ever worked with the littles. The oldest I ever worked was fifth graders. And I never gave as much thought to transition planning to my littles as I should have. Could I go back and redo it? I would change it completely. I was always trying to think about skills, of course, and you know, jobs around the school and that type of thing, but I never really thought it out all the way to what will this kindergartner, what will this five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old do as an adult? I didn't think that far and I wish I had. So I would ask you to do exactly the thing that I did not do and think about that as what do you want this five-year-old to be able to do? And how can you think about that for them? So one of the ways that you can do that is really to think about it in terms of what we what is referred to as meaningful day. Several years ago, uh, another team member and I went to a conference and they really, it was, it was all around B13 and transition planning. And they really talked about this concept of meaningful day. And as I was sitting there listening to it, I was really just so struck with how important this really is, right? I mean, we all have in our own lives, we do the things that for us make our days meaningful. And we really need to think about that for all of the students and all of the individuals that we work with. So meaningful day was defined for us at this conference as individualized access for persons with developmental disabilities to support their participation in activities and functions of community life that are desired and chosen by the general population. So we want you to just kind of keep that in mind. And meaningful day, and think about how this, you know, it fits into your own life, right? So purposeful and meaningful work, we have to work, we want to do something that is purposeful and meaningful, substantial and sustained opportunity for optimal health, self-empowerment, personalized relationships, skill development and maintenance, employment, educational, social, community inclusion activities. All of these pieces should link back to that individual's vision. What are their goals? What are their outcomes? Where do they want to go? Where do they see themselves? And so these pieces really fit into making a meaningful day. And all people and their families have the right to this opportunity, right? We all should have opportunities that lend themselves to a meaningful day. And we all have the right to live, love, work, play, and pursue our own life aspirations in our community in a way that makes sense to us and in a way that fulfills us. So, really think about what's important to you. What are your passions, your life's purpose? How can you be self-aware when you're trying to figure these pieces out? Focus, spend money on people more than things, live with compassion. How can you give back or simplify? What are your daily goals? So what I'd like you to do, it's a small group, but what I'd like you to do is just in the chat box, just. Tell me something that makes your life meaningful. 
when you think about all of those, those bullets, those bullet points on those slides, or if there's something different, like what in your life makes it meaningful? And I'll, I will just say that my family, obviously that's a big one, of course, but work, I love the job I do. I'm blessed that I get to do it. Um, I've been in jobs that were not quite as fulfilling and that really impacted how I thought about my day. So put in chat something that you think makes life meaningful to you. And it could be anything. Jennifer, Chihuahua. Jennifer has a doggy named Rue. Yes, he is fabulous. Family, of course, of course. Family and friends. Let me open up chat so I can see everybody. Family and friends, family, work, helping others. Yeah. So these are the things that we all that we all want in our life so that we can have a meaningful day, so that we can have meaningful purpose, right? Family and music. Great. Thank you. So when you think about those for yourself, it's also really important to think about those for our students, right? And just remember that everybody deserves the opportunity to live a life that is meaningful to them. It's very important. So how does this translate to the, to the students that we work with, to the youths in our programs? And how are we supporting them? How are we helping them understand what meaningful day might be for them? Or how are we helping them articulate that? What assessments are being used to try to help them understand this? How are we using those results of those assessments to talk about this with students and with families? Are the activities and the services that we provide the students in our classrooms, are they meaningful to the student? And what are we really doing to help them achieve their post-secondary goals? We want them to understand that they are, they deserve that quality of life and what does that mean to them? So think about those guiding questions. Is there, I would be shocked, nothing in chat other than what you all chose to share. Great. And I think I'm turning it over to somebody. It's me. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> All right. So we are going to talk about the actual documentation of on the transition plan. Um, all right. So section three of the IEP considerations. The last one is, is the child in ninth grade or above? And if yes, you could see it says section nine, which is the transition plan, should be completed before completing the remainder of the IEP. And if you think about it, really high school for all students is getting them prepared for post-secondary life. So that IEP really should all feed into um, that transition plan. And this is just what the transition plan looks like. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with it. Um, IDEA requires transition plans for students starting at age 16. In Maine, it's no later than ninth grade. So what that means is sometime during the ninth grade year, um, you would want to start that transition plan. Um, all right, so we start ninth grade year, but as Colette was saying, um, the more research that comes out, it shows the earlier, the better for um, starting transition planning. So start early. Your transition plan must show movement, and we will kind of mention this quite a bit as we go through each section. Um, for a few of the sections, we recommend that you keep kind of the older things on there and just put the year in parentheses that it was done just to show that movement and that, um, because you know, the ninth grader and the 12th grader, by the in between, they're gonna change their mind 500 times about what they wanna do. And as you do more assessments with them, it'll kind of whittle it down. So show that movement on your transition plan. And we will definitely talk about that more. So these are all of the things we look at um, for compliance. And as 
Colette said, if even one of these things is not compliant, we have to report it as a non-compliant transition plan. So it's all or nothing. So if you forget to check off the purpose of the meeting is post-secondary planning on your advanced written notice, but it's a really good, strong, robust transition plan, we still have to report it as non-compliant. So it is quite frustrating for all of us. So purpose of the meeting and child invited to meeting, these are both, um, we look at the advance written notice for both of these. So it's just make sure you always check that um, post-secondary goals and transition services. I mean, if you're teaching high school, that should probably be checked every single time, just get into that habit. And make sure the child is always invited best practice is like it shows here where the student is in the salutation. Um, if you just list them on that second page, um, the list of attendees, that is compliant as well. You could also send them their own advance written notice. And that would be pretty awesome. Um, agency invited with parents prior written consent. Um, we found out recently that we were kind of misreading the law on this. So um, it's going to be what we look at is going to change a little bit or a lot. Um, so procedural manual, page 41, talks about this. Um, and also on page 47 of the procedural manual is a copy of that. Um, parental consent to invite other agencies form if you need the form. Um, so what the law says is that the public agency, which is you, must invite a representative of any participating agency that is likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services. So they have to be invited by you. Um, this is where we were misreading that. So you wanna make sure that you are keeping track of this parental consent form, right? You wanna fill in the date that it was sent to the parents so that, and keep a copy of it so that if you don't get it back, you can show that you attempted to get that consent, right? If it doesn't come back, you don't invite them because you don't have parental consent and that's okay, but you need to show that you attempted to get that consent. Um, consent is needed prior to the advance written notice for the meeting, right? Because you're gonna put that agency on the advance written notice to invite them. And it is needed for every meeting where transition planning is discussed. So it's not a one and done, it's not an every year, it's every single meeting where transition planning is discussed. So we know that's a lot. So if there is an agency that you really don't know that they are going to be involved or they might be involved and the parent shows up with them, right? You didn't know that they were going to be involved or they might have been involved. So really document that in the written notice. I would, I would put a statement in the written notice saying, you know, the parent brought blah, blah, blah agency. Um, going forward, we will invite them now that we know that they're gonna be involved. Um, so going forward, that invitation has to come from you. Um, so that's an important thing. And I think I'm gonna turn over to Carly here. But before I do, do you have questions about that agency invited thing? Cause I know that's a big change for you guys. Okay. All you, Carly. All right. Thanks. Okay. So the next piece that we look at um, is making sure that there are, that the post-secondary goals are updated annually. So we would look in the written notice for this. Um, so when looking at the written notice, again, we just look to make sure that that post-secondary is checked off as a purpose of the meeting. And then um, also in the written notice, somewhere in the written notice, it doesn't have to be under number five but just that there's a statement 
saying that the transition plan was reviewed and updated or that the team reviewed it and updated the transition goals. So there needs to be a statement in the written notice around that. Um, also on the transition plan, the procedural manual says on page 37 that you do need to fill in the projected date of graduation. Make sure that you include the month and year of that projected date of graduation. Um, and of course, if that date changes for whatever reason, if they are credit deficient or if there's planning beyond the four years, you can adjust that date just as you would adjust anything else on the transition plan. Um, and then just document that in the written notice as clearly as possible. And just to note that if you're planning for the student to go beyond the four years, um, that planning should start as early as possible. And then another part of the transition plan is that uh, section 9B, where we look at those transition assessments, those age appropriate transition assessments. And so in 9B, we would expect to see a list of transition assessments listed there. And as Jennifer talked about earlier, it's best to leave the ones that were completed before um, and keep all of those kind of to show that movement. Um, so you can see here that there was an informal student interview done in 2021, and then a couple of other transition, transition assessments done in 2022. Um, so these are just some examples of acceptable transition assessments that can be listed here. And then there are other assessments that sometimes get listed here, but they really don't have a transition component. So they are not compliant to be in this section. There would need to be those ones with those transition components. And again, on the transition plan, you have that list or uh, of those transition assessments that are completed, but you can also um, put it in section 4A where results of evaluations are stated. And so you can see here those evaluations that are completed as part of a reeval or initial evaluation are there, but they've also included the results of the transition assessments in this section also. And this is not necessary. Um, it's just a suggestion that can be done. Um, and then we, at this time, there is no list of assessments, but we have some links to transition assessments within this PowerPoint, um, and we're working to get that on the website. So here's one uh, link to the quick book of transition assessments, and I think we have some other resources at the end. Okay, and then this is, oh, this is about section 9C of that transition plan, um, where it's asking around the student attending the meeting. And so you just want to document in this section, whether just say that the student attend the meeting, or if they did not, you really want to document those efforts made to get their um, their preferences and interests and get their input into developing that transition plan. Even if they weren't able to attend the meeting, you want to document when you had a conversation with them to develop that transition plan with them. All right, and I believe I'm turning it over to Ashley for this part. Yeah, yes. Um, all right, so the next part that we look at is the measurable post-secondary goals in education, employment, and independent living. And that is section 9D of the transition plan. Um, so here is where you're gonna want to document the formal and or informal training that the student will receive after high school that will enable them to make progress towards a chosen career. And these are written as will statements. So um, one of the important things here is that the education and training goal should really align to that employment goal so for a student who might be interested in being like an auto mechanic, if the employment goal was to be employed as an auto mechanic, um, the education goal should align to that in like um, doing a auto mechanic program or um, studying auto mechanics, something like that. So those should just be linked or make sense together. Um, and then for the independent living skill goal, um, that is a when appropriate, so that doesn't have to be filled out. That can be blank depending on the student, but we like to think that 
what high school student couldn't benefit from a little bit of that independent living um, skills. So really think about those things like budgeting and bills or cleaning, cooking, all of those kind of um, skills that could help really any student. Um, and there's really um, usually something you can find to put for an independent living skill there. Um, and so this is an example of what that could look like. For the education and training goal, we have the student will attend a four-year college or university to study marketing. Um, and then the, the employment goal is that the student will work in the field of marketing. So notice that those are linked together. Um, and we um, caution not to put a specific university or job there because you can't ensure that they will get into the school they're hoping, but um, just leaving it kind of vague like the college or university um, all of market. Um, some exceptions to that I think we talked about uh, are if it's a family business that you know that they're going to go into, that would be acceptable. And then for the independent living skill goal, it has that the student will live independently and will access mental health supports in his community with support from his parents. So that's what um, an example of Section 9D could look like. So for 90, uh, this always makes me laugh because I think every kid right now thinks they're going to be a YouTube star or a, you know, influencer. That's the, <laughs> I see some nods. Um, so what if the child wants to be something like that or a professional video game? Um, so what we advise is to just um, allow them the opportunity to explore that and kind of maybe give them experiences that are relatable. So they could work on developing their career exploration skills like interview practice, resume development, job shadowing if you know somebody that they could job shadow. Um, interviewing somebody in that field is always a good option. And then finding relatable jobs that are maybe more attainable, um, such as for a video gamer, game tester, or game designer, maybe like retail in a game store or something like that. Um, so just um, not discouraging those big dreams, um, but finding a way to kind of make it more um, approachable. Um, and then here's that alignment piece. So in section 9D, where you have those post-secondary goals, there must be alignment to at least one annual goal in section five that addresses those post-secondary goals. So you would not create a, a standalone transition goal in section five, because that wouldn't be measurable for after high school. Once the kids uh, graduated, you wouldn't be able to measure whether they're employed in, or, or you know, at a college, et cetera. So it's best practice to just attach the transition goal to an existing goal that you would already have and be working on. So you can <clears throat> either have the education, employment, and independent living um, be aligned to one goal each, or you could have them all aligned to one goal. Um, neither, we don't prefer one way or the other, just how it works best for that student, um, as long as they're all represented. And we have some examples of what that would look like. Um, so for this student, um, there was already an academic goal in place to address the student's writing uh, deficit. And then to align that, all this, um, all we did was add in the statement of give an SDI in writing, which would have already been there in preparation for a career in marketing. There's that link, there's that alignment. Um, student will write informative essays to examine and then the rest of the goal. So you don't need to re-goal to the secondary goal, um, just link it to section five, a goal that was already there. And here's another example that was already in place around anxiety. Um, and it was given social work services and in preparation for attending a four-year college or university to study marketing, the student will work on managing their anxiety by using techniques and that can benefit them in their living skill too if they had a post-secondary goal around that. So you can just include that all in one. So um, before we move on to course of study, are there any questions specific to those measurable post-secondary goals? 
All right. I love this small group and um, we can move right on to the course of study. That's going to be in this section 9E. <laughs> All right, so um, the course of study is the course schedule that is the multi-year through the exit of or anticipated exit of high school for the student. Um, it should be specific, uh, individualized, and directly linked to those post-secondary goals. Um, so you can see an example here, the student would have entered high school in 2022 and gone and was expected to go through 2026. Um, and it's listed out specifically what they will take. Um, you can see the courses there and you can see the connection. This student must have been looking into carpentry or I think it was marketing. Um, and some points on this that um, make sure that it's tailored to the student and their identified post-secondary goals. Um, it should be multi-year through the exit of high school. If the student does enter mid-year, just start at the current date that they come in and then go to the projected exit date or, or mid-career, mid-high school career. And then our guidance is to not write electives. Really have the student look at the course um, courses available or talk to the student about what might apply to them um, and write the specific elective that they want to do. And we know that those are going to change and you can change them as you update the transition plan every year. And it's okay that um, it does change. And then just be more specific than the child will complete graduation requirements. So really it should list what they're working on. Um, and then the next thing on the list is section 9F and these are the transition services for the student. And you'll see everywhere these are highlighted, not child will statements. So um, we'll get into that. Um, so here's where you, you're going to um, list what the student is going to be. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, Jennifer, it looks like you've got the chat. Um, Jennifer or Carly, can I pass this section back over to you real quick? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, okay, so section 9F is where those transition services are listed, um, and it would be not those child will statements. We give guidance to document this in a bulleted form and leave off any uh, distinction that the child would be responsible for this, because these really are services provided by the adults in the school and in the community. So these are not things that the student is doing these are the services being provided to the student. Um, and so, and I know Jennifer likes to, she kind of uh, relates this to the service grid in section seven, where you outline the services for the IEP. Um, this is kind of like the services for the transition plan, if you think about it that way. Um, and so you can see here, there are some examples of those education instruction and related services. Um, again, those dates are there when they're receiving those services uh, because they're just left on there, but they may not be receiving them currently, but they were in the past, but we want to leave those on there to show that movement. Um, and same with those other career employment, community experiences, and again, if appropriate, daily living skills. Um, that's the only one that could be blank, potentially. The other ones all should have at least one uh, activity or service listed in that section. So in that section 9F, just remember that these services and activities are occurring during the life of the IEP. They're provided by the adults in the school or community. They're intended to help the student focus on the, what they want to do. Um, and it's able to show movement when previous years are left on the IEP but these transition services and activities are not written as child will statements and they are not to include future services. So they can have current and past, just not future. All right, section 10 of the transition plan. Um, this is where you indicate the date the student and parents were informed of the transfer of rights at the age of majority, which is 18. And so uh, just keep in mind that this should be completed at or before the IEP meeting for the year the student will turn 17. 
And this date does not change. So once they have been informed, you would check that off, yes, and put the date that they were informed, and then that would stay constant. Okay. So transition plans really should be student-centered. It's really about, um, you know, allowing them to be active community members and just thinking about that meaningful day and what is meaningful to the student, right? And so that transition plan is really based off of what they want. Um, family engagement is a huge part of this, getting the family involved. Uh, assessment, assessment, assessment. So those transition assessments, you know, getting as much information for the student as possible to help them understand what they do want to do. Because in the chat, that question came up, what if the student really just does not know what they want to do? You know, and so those transition assessments are designed to help give them some guidance and give them some ideas of, about what they're interested in and, you know, what they potentially could do. And so um, just really working with them to get those ideas. Uh, and then also remembering that the student must be invited. And if they can't attend that meeting, really making sure that their input is included because this is their plan. This is about what they want. Um, and then just remembering that those outside agencies, if you do know that there are outside agencies um, involved, including them as part of the IEP team and inviting them, they must be invited as Jennifer went over. Here is a link to the transition planning professional development um, website. So on here, this is a collaboration between our trainings for the B13 compliance, but it also has transition planning that goes beyond compliance. Um, so there are a lot of good professional development modules there that you can access at any time. Then a link to the transition main website and they have some wonderful resources there and I know we said that we were working on getting some transition assessment uh, links on our Aussie website and that's not there but I'm pretty sure if you went to this website they would have plenty of those resources. Okay any questions that have come up that we have not gone over yet? Okay, we'll just move on. We have a few checklists that we will share. Uh, this is the checklist that we went through today about the pieces that our team looks at when we look at those um, components of the transition plan for that B13 indicator. And then there's also a link to this B13 checklist that just kind of helps you as you work through your transition plan. And it's in a yes, no format. And so if you have it, Excellent. If not, then try to figure out how you can include that. Oh, and then we have our case study. And this is about Bill. And if anybody else wants to jump in and add things, otherwise I'm just gonna kind of go through Bill. He's a 19 year old. He receives specially designed instruction with an alternate curriculum in a self-contained setting all day. And you can see he has some related services as well. Um, and including nursing, um, and he's being fed via a G-tube, and he has a tracheotomy and uses a ventilator with oxygen to breathe. So he is a very involved student. So what do you do with these kiddos when you're developing your transition plan that um, are a lot more involved? Um, you still go through the same process. So you would think about uh, what, you know, and try to get Bill's input through whatever means of communication he has. Um, and Bill has decided that he wants to participate in an in-home or center-based program designed to provide habilitative and vocational training with medical and therapeutic supports. And he will participate in on-the-job training and using micro switches. So that is his, has been identified as a strength for him. And so that has gone into his education and training goal. And then his employment goal is around participating in technology supported or volunteer workplace with supported job development services through vocational rehabilitation or voc rehab. And then his independent living skills goal is that he'll live at home and participate to the maximum extent possible 
in his daily routines, such as feeding, dressing, bathing, activating small appliances, media devices, choice making, etc. So you can see here, these are what Bill's um, measurable post-secondary goals look like on the IEP. And those are based off of Bill's strengths because on the IEP in section 4B, or they go into his strengths, I should say, they discovered that Bill is curious and stays alert and awake throughout the school day. He enjoys getting verbal and tactile attention from peers and staff. He tolerates position changes on a mat table and allows hand-over-hand -hand assistance to participate in activities. And Bill likes using a switch with assistance to activate a variety of devices, including a radio and a computer. So here is that functional gap in section five. Oh no, functional gaps are in section 4D, sorry, getting ahead of myself. So his skill deficits are around expressive and receptive communication um, and his ability to independently use a one button communication device. So this affects his ability to interact and communicate effectively with peers and staff. And he also has some limited fine motor skills. And so, um, he needs some, he has dependency for all care and hand over hand assistance for all activities. So these are his deficits, which then go into goals for him in section five. And so this goal, um, speech and language goal is that he will independently and accurately use his augmented, augmentative device to communicate yes to indicate a desire for an item. And then you can see that they've added that statement in preparation for education, employment, and independent living with 50%, because this goal aligns with his education, training, employment, and independent living goals from his transition plan, because it was around that being able to use that the switches. All right, any questions? Um, before we just, we're just going to kind of quickly go through the frequently asked questions. We don't go and read through them. Um, you have access to this PowerPoint and you can reference them if you want to read through them. But any questions at this point? Okay. All right. So there are just a few frequently asked questions that we include here. I'm just going to kind of skip through them. And I already asked if there are any questions, so I'm pretty sure there still aren't any. And these are the resources that we just included. If you want to explore these, the procedural manual, you could see on each or many of the slides throughout the PowerPoint, there were references to the procedural manual. Great resource gives directions, instructions, examples, and that includes the transition plan piece. Um, Link to Muser, the Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations. We also have that link to Titus and Leora. They are the eligibility to 22 um, contact people for the Department of Education. And as I said at the beginning or before, um, these are some links to other transition websites that you can visit, and they may have some. Um, more information, including that assessment, transition assessment piece, if you're interested in that. So just more resources. And then this is our page of resources that we share. The first one is a link to our professional development calendar. The second one will bring you to links for recordings and PowerPoints of all of our office hours or any other PD that our team does. Um, and then other special ed resources. This is just a our professional development schedule for the 20 through 23, 24 school year. Many of these dates have already come and gone on this first slide, um, but this second slide, we do trainings all the way through the end of May. So feel free to join us for any of these professional development opportunities. We also share some that you could share with others, such as your general ed teachers or more specifically your related service providers. We have some that are geared more for them. Um, the discipline and manifestation determination one, 
was completed in October, but that um, is a live link. We recorded that training and it is available on our uh, professional learning page. And then this is our feedback and contact our link. So let me see if I can multitask and get through the link. I will drop it in the chat here. There we go. And there you go. So that link will take you to our feedback and contact our form. Um, so we really appreciate feedback on our professional development. Uh, and then you will be asked to select a training. Today's training is the B13 training. And you can receive a contact hour certificate for attending this training today if you enter your email. So just make sure to spell it correctly so it gets to you. And our contact information once again, if you have any questions or we can support you in a, any way, please reach out to us. We do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. And we thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, this training has been recorded, so it will be up on our website as soon as Julie works her magic. Harley, can I just interrupt you for just one quick second? Oh, could please you, do. Could you please share with everybody about um, feeling about sending in IEPs, transition plans, et cetera, for feedback? Oh, yes. So when we say contact us for anything, we really do mean anything. You can send us um, hypotheticals. So if you have a goal that you are like, oh, is this goal okay? And, you know, since we're talking about B13, is this goal appropriate? Does it align to the transition goals? Anything like that, feel free to email us with hypotheticals like that. Just make sure that they are just in the email, not in an IEP. Um, because we are required, if we see non-compliance, we have to ask for correction of that and then uh, proof of systemic compliance. So just as a hypothetical, you can always shoot us an email and be like, is this an okay goal? Or I'm thinking about putting this in my transition plan, you know, for my courses of study or for the services under 9F and just making sure it's a hypothetical. Um, and we will be happy to get back to you with feedback around that. Yeah, thank you, Carly. And that is something that we have a lot of people who access that that as an option. So please feel free to do that because we want you to be successful. So if you're working on an IEP and you're just not sure you have questions, like like Carly said, send it to us as a hypothetical and we'll give you feedback. Great. Okay, so I think no one else has any questions or any other things to share. I think that we are finished up for today. So thank you all so much for joining us. Great.